Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I am the host of this show. You know, every week I get to talk to such interesting CEOs, founders, entrepreneurs of all kinds of different companies, ranging from YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, OpenTable, Axe Software, and many more. I'm also the co founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects using podcasts and content marketing. Also, you know my story. I'm a recovering political hack and a recovering lawyer, <laughs> spent years working in politics including as a speechwriter with stints working in the Clinton White House and for a California governor. Spent years practicing law. And 10 years ago, I discovered this medium of podcasting. I've been doing it ever since. And my guest today actually is a new convert to podcasting. And I say, the more the merrier. I wish everyone would start a podcast because of so many great things that have flowed to my life. And I know that he's going to benefit so tremendously from it. And his name is Mark Randolph. He was the co-founder and first CEO of Netflix, a little company you may have heard of before. He's a seasoned entrepreneur and advisor. He's founded over a half dozen successful startups and mentored scores of other early stage entrepreneurs throughout his career, which is actually what he's doing on his new podcast. It's really cool. You'll have to check it out. Since his retirement from Netflix in 2003, Mark has become a sought after international speaker, sharing his wisdom with entrepreneurs around the world. He's the author of the internationally, the internationally best-selling book, That Will Never Work, The Birth of Netflix and the Amazing Life in Emma and of an idea, excuse me for butchering that. And now he's also the creator of the That Will Never Work podcast. And in, in addition to Netflix, one of his more recent companies was Looker Data, Data Sciences, which was sold to Google in 2019 for $2.6 billion. Mark, such a pleasure to have you on here. And I wanna uh, take you back to um, a, a story that you told, I heard you told, um, and I, you know, when I was in, in college, I was involved in some different political campaigns where I'd go knock on doors, door to door. And I think that was so formative for me. It's such a great experience taking that raw rejection. I tell people all the time, go to door to door, suffer rejection early on. And you told a story about you having to go out on the streets and survive and, and ask people for handouts. And, and in retrospect, it made raising money in Silicon Valley not that hard. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Well, yeah, certainly. Well, first of all, thanks, John, for having me on. And thanks for the uh, shout out on my new podcast here, which is uh, all new territory for me. And it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that someone who basically had their biggest accomplished being helping people spend more time in front of a screen is now doing something which is all audio. <laughs> but life is strange that way. But the story that you're, um, you're referring to took place many, many years ago. Uh, when I had a summer, I had summer jobs, I'm kind of a big outdoors person, mountaineering, backpacking, climbing. And so I'd spend my summer, spent two months this summer, and I'd work out west leading um, outdoor climbing trips. But then one month of the year, I would go and work for a school in Connecticut that used the wilderness as more of a rehabilitation um, uh, format. Um, you know, they called it a, 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 for adjudicated youth, I think was the term, but uh, we called it a kind of informally hoods in the woods. And the way it would work is you'd take kids out of the inner city who basically had pretty much never stepped off a sidewalk in their lives, and you'd put them out in the woods. You'd have them canoeing and climbing and rappelling and hiking. And of course, they'd feel out of their element. And it gave you a chance to show them this disconnect between what they believed was impossible and what in fact was possible uh, and how they could apply that back to their lives. So anyway, the training for this, one element of it was they wanted to have us be able to understand that feeling of being out of your element. And of course they couldn't put us in the woods because we were all uh, totally comfortable there. So they flipped it. And which is why one afternoon found me being pushed out of a van with no wallet and no watch and no money and no ID uh, in the middle of Hartford, Connecticut, 
with the promise that they would come and pick me up three days later. Uh, and the only thing I had was uh, a phone number written on my arm in a Sharpie, which I could call if I got in trouble. Uh, but of course, I would rather have chewed my arm off than uh, <laughs> use that phone number. Uh, but anyway, it was great. At first, you know, I was out in the city. I was having no problems wandering around. And then, of course, being a 20-something young man, I uh, began getting hungry uh, and decided I need to eat. Uh, and my first strategy was I went to the food court. And this is a little embarrassing, but this, this is not I, a bad strategy, actually. Yeah, I would hover and I'd watch someone get up from their plate and walk away without bussing their tray. And I'd swoop in uh, and I'd finish the half eaten food on their plate. I mean, I, I called it uh, doing the seagull. <laughs> uh, but after a while, I said, okay, I'm going to try and cut out the middleman here. I'm going to, rather than, scavenging, let me try and get some money and I'll buy my own food. And I came up with the idea that I would panhandle. And I thought, how hard could panhandling be? And the answer, of course, is really hard. There is something about having to walk up to someone and make this naked ask where you just want money and you have really nothing in return to give them. But um, you know, as you were saying, having a door-to-door -door job you very quickly learn to adapt. You go, wow, that person held the door open a fraction of a second longer. That person almost smiled for a moment. And you internalize what you did to get that reaction. And it took me probably an hour and a half just to get up the courage to finally approach someone. And then numerous tries before someone finally gave me something. But over the course of the afternoon, I got better. And the fascinating thing was that eventually what worked for me was being transparent, being honest, that going up to someone and saying, you know, could you help me out? I am really hungry. And they could see it in my face. And it was a connection. Uh, and it ended up working. And it was something I took with me because we're always asking for things. We're always asking for help. Um, and many times the ask is disproportionate in what you have to give versus what you're asking. And I found out, as you referred to, is that once you have spent a full afternoon panhandling for 50 cents on the streets of Hartford, Connecticut, it's really not that tough asking for twenty-five dollars or $50,000 for a startup. Mm, yeah. Now, it, what's really interesting is you had spent, you'd worked for other companies, and but you really wanted to start your own company. And there's these stories out there about Netflix starting because Reed Hastings had gotten a large overdue fee, which isn't exactly true. And you kind of make the point in, in your book that that's not exactly, it's not like this kind of sudden incident that, that leads to a, a shock of lightning idea, but it's rather more hard work. And it was actually a series of carpools. So I love that. Tell us that story. Yeah, you know, we all want that epiphany moment because we kind of love that idea of the Archimedes. That's what we've been fed. Yeah, the Archimedes and all of a sudden, you are you know, the apple yeah. hits Newton on the head or yep. the guy's sell, his girlfriend sells Pez dispensers and boom, there's eBay. Mm. And the reason you come up with those stories is no one really wants to hear the long story. You know, the long story is hours and pages. And so quickly you go, okay, you just come up with something which is emotionally resonant. But the, the, the real story is, of course, a bit longer in that um, Reed Hastings and I, who had worked together at a previous company, uh, one that Reed had founded, uh, were all of a sudden going to be out of a job because we sold that company. Uh, and I was ready to do the next thing. I was going to start another company because Netflix I mean, was actually number six. Uh, so when this one was gone, I went, OK, I'm starting another company. And Reed uh, didn't want to start another company. He was going to become an educational philanthropist, but kind of wanted to keep his hand in this whole startup game. And so we came to an agreement that he would be my angel investor, that uh, he would be on the board, uh, that I would start and run the company, and we'd both kind of get what we wanted. But what you're mentioning is that process of there's one little piece missing, which is what is this company going to be? What's the idea? Right. And, and I love some of the rejected ideas. I have to just throw okay. these out there because we could be doing an interview right now about personalized shampoo delivered by mail, personalized surfboards, 
personalized baseball bats, all the other ideas that were rejected. Custom dog food. Don't forget custom dog <laughs> custom food. Dog food. <laughs> yeah, I, I was yeah. I was an idea machine. And, There's still and, time, Mark. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, wonderfully. Some of these have actually happened. So I go, I wasn't so far off. But yeah. listen, one of the one of the even more ridiculous ideas than personalized shampoo and custom dog food was doing. We pitched. I pitched video rental by mail. That we would mail people videos and that they'd watch them and return them, and. It was a big category, $8 billion a year with an entrenched yeah. competitor that everyone hated, Blockbuster. Yeah. Um, the problem was, this is back in 1997. Uh, and if you VHS. remember, I don't know, yeah. maybe, you, maybe you remember, I guess you yeah. I Clinton, remember, but I was going to say, we Clinton have to explain for the younger listeners that there was a time <laughs> when you had to trek down to a store and pick out what was left over on a Friday or Saturday night. And it sucked. And even then, back then, the movies came on those big VHS cassettes. Yeah. These big, massive things. It's like people of my generation remembering eight tracks. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, that didn't work. I did a lot of research and said, there's no way we can make this economically work, mailing it to someone and getting them back. But there was this breakthrough, which is one day while we were carpooling to work together, Reed mentioned he'd read about this technology called a DVD, this little thin piece of plastic thin and light that they're going to put movies on them and it kind of gave us an idea or more accurately it dusted off an idea which several months ago we had put a lot of time into thinking through how it might work and realized this could be the key uh and then this is the key thing i believe which is that we did not then immediately go quick let's go to the office and work on a business plan for this great new business we did not put together pitch decks. We did not apply to do Shark Tank or something like that. We did the quintessential entrepreneur thing, which is immediately figure out, is there a way we can figure out if this idea even has any validity? And so mid-commute, we turned the car around and drove back down to Santa Cruz where we lived and went looking for a DVD, which of course there weren't any. There were like only a hundred or so titles that were even available at that point. Well, it wasn't even barely available. It was in yeah. test market. Yeah. Uh, and so we go, oh, what the hell? We'll buy, a D we'll buy a CD. How different could that be? We bought a used CD. And we then we bought, went a couple of doors down to a gift store and bought a little pink envelope, like you put a greeting card in. <laughs> and we mailed the used CD to Reed's house in Santa Cruz. Do you still have the envelope, by the way? <laughs> no. You know, I wish I had. I, I have some archives, but boy, that one is long gone. That's Probably uh, sat in the back seat of Reed's Wait, car for a couple months. And, and then I think you said it was, a, it was a Patsy Cline CD or something I like that? I think so. Yeah. Do you still have the CD? Oh, come on. No, not a chance. <laughs> he threw them out. <laughs> yeah. Me too. I don't have any of my CDs. But I, I, I'll sell you an NFT about the, uh, the, the idea behind that. There you go. Uh, <laughs> um, no, so and you know, that, and so all of a sudden, the next morning, you know, Reed just shows up to pick me up, and he has this little envelope, unbroken CD. Got to his house in a day, yep. for a price of a stamp, and you know, as that was, if there was a real inciting moment, um, that was probably it. It told you that this could possibly work, but it was it's interesting the timing because it was still it was still a bit of a gamble because you had, there was no guarantee that people were going to buy DVD players to replace their VHS and that people were going to adopt this and that, and also that the DVDs were going to be affordable enough because one of the things you wrote about in the book is that VHSs were sold by the studios for like 80 bucks, a hundred bucks a pop. Whereas for, for an interesting reason, the studios decided to sell DVDs for a lot cheaper and it made the economics a lot more palatable for you. You know, people discount, the amount of luck that goes into success. Uh, so many things have to break your way. And it was in some ways kind of insanity to start a company that was predicated on DVD when DVD had barely launched. And there was certainly no assurance that DVD wouldn't go the way of, now I'll really date myself, go the way of a Betamax as a competing format would take it down or go the way of the laser disc where it gets to a certain penetration and stops. And if either of those things had happened, you know, as you mentioned, we were probably talking now about dog food or shampoo right. or something, right. but you, you're right. It was crazy that, that, that bet um, paid off. And now even your wife said that idea isn't going to work. Yeah. But that's, that's, I think we got to admit that's pretty common. 
I mean, everybody who's pitching ideas for things that haven't happened before, everyone says that'll never work. And you're right. You know, my investors said that. My employees said that. My wife, thank you, said that. Um, but it's okay because no one knows anything. You know, what do they know? Right. Uh, it hasn't been tried before. The only way to figure out whether it's going to work is to try it. And I think that that really is what separates um, a true entrepreneur from everybody else is that they don't just harbor the ideas in their head. They say, let's figure out a way to test it. Let's and, figure out a way to try it. And you were fortunate that you had a small team that had come over with you from the other company that helped you really to, to test that idea over a period of months and help to do market research and figure out how you could make it work. Yeah, you know, one of the big advantages, I was 38 when I started Netflix. And one of the big advantages of doing it when you're a little bit older is you've got to, you had this track record of working with other people. I mean, as I mentioned before, I'd done five startups previously. And you find people who share this same enjoyment at coming into work every day, having no idea what you're going to work on and share that feeling of the thing you worked on. All of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. You got to find something new, but enjoy that. And once you collect them all, each time you launch a new business, it's like an episode. It's like watching the blues brothers or any other of those kind of buddy movies where it's, let's get the band back together again. Yeah. And you gather them all together. And yes, I, I was lucky. I had these people who, we're able to come right in with excitement um, and enthusiasm to go, let's figure out a way to make this crazy idea work. Yeah. Now you had had this, you had experience, you'd been co-founder of the US version of Mac user magazine and also co-founded uh, two of the first mail order sources of computer products. There's that famous um, speech that uh, Steve Jobs gave about how you can only connect the dots looking backwards rather than looking forward. So connect the dots for me now, how that previous experience helped you as you're building Netflix. So the, 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 the whole first path of my career, I was a direct marketing person. You know, I did junk mail, I did catalogs, I did direct response television, I did magazine circulation. All of these is, that's direct marketing. And for some reason, when I first was exposed to it in my 20s, it spoke to me. You know, and again, looking backward, it probably spoke to me because it was this combination of art and science that you could know, with no down to the seventh decimal point, how much better the red envelope was versus the blue envelope. But you still had to say, of those 10,000 colored envelopes, what colors do I try? Or do I even test envelope color at all? It was this creativity meets analytics. And I did that for a long time. I mean, I did that for a good 10 plus years. Um, and what happened is that when the internet came along, all of a sudden I saw in the internet some things that I don't think a lot of other people recognize, which is how incredibly powerful a tool this could be for direct response, for deep personalization. Because at the time in my direct marketing world, personalization was sending out a mailing to someone that said, dear John, won't all your friends at 17 Crescent Circle? Be, you know, it was such blunt force personalization. Whereas the internet, you could be, have a different website for every individual person catered to their tastes. Thus, these pitches of personalized shampoo, custom dog food, uh, and both of those were subscription business. We're going to be subscription businesses. So, I was really just taking the thing that I'd already spent so many years loving and mastering and recognizing a whole new palette to, uh, to play with. You know, I think a lot of people remember the delight you open up your mailbox and you look in and there's the red envelope. So at what point did you have that realization that that, that would really help it stand out? What, the red envelope or just having it? Yeah, the red envelope. Yeah, you get the red look. Oh, we got a movie. Good. We got another movie. It came. It arrived. Well, the, yeah, there, there is a certain glee in that. And, and you know, when we, when this idea that everyone said will never work, uh, they were right because it didn't work. And for that first year and a half, it was terrible. Red envelope or not, it would not get anyone to love it. What changed 
was when we, a year and a half in, finally came up with the even crazier idea of doing the no due dates, no late fees, subscription, yep. and a queue. So how was it priced initially? Uh, it was 1995. Oh, before we, it was a la carte. For the first year and a half, it was a la carte, four bucks. Mm, mm, four four bucks dollars. For ah. You rent a movie, we mail it to you, you keep it for seven days, and you get it mailed back to us. And if you're late, we're going to hit you with a late fee. I mean, there was not oh. a lot of business model innovation here. So it, it was a so stupid idea. Netflix is known as this very intelligent data company now. Was that a, what did you, use the data from that first year and a half to make that educated decision about changing to the subscript flat fee subscription, no, no over due dates, or was it more of a gut instinct? This isn't working. We'll try this. It was a gut instinct thing, but don't forget we had tried several hundred other things which hadn't worked. And we certainly had, it wasn't like, Oh, we've got this one, which is going to work, but let's do all a year and a half worth of crap first. Uh, this was as likely or unlikely to fail as all the others. We really didn't know. And in some ways, this one was even more irrational because it was so out there. I mean, this was, the, the, Reed and I, one, you know, one day we're in the warehouse and surrounded by 100,000 DVDs sitting in boxes on shelves and asking ourselves how, how crazy it was that we're storing them here where they're useless and led to this brainstorming of, would there be a way to store them at the customer's houses? Do you do peer to peer? And that's where you come up with the idea, well, maybe we could just let them keep them as long as they want and swap them back when they're done and we'll mail them another one. And uh, that was a crazy idea. But even that wouldn't have worked without a couple things. It needed subscription, but it also needed that queue because the queue, that list of movies you wanted to see was the magic. Because what it did is you put a mail, uh, you put your disc in the mail and then went about your day. And then not only did the next day a disc arrive, but something was in it you'd wanted to see. You didn't have to go order it. You didn't have to think again, I need to get a movie. It just showed up. Right. It was, right. It was an amazingly magical experience. And lo and behold, again, looking backwards, it just worked. Right. Just took it, off. It led to such happiness because you, you were much more likely to get movies that you actually wanted to watch rather than going down to the store, being stuck, finding whatever was left over. Um, now, you didn't call the service DVDs by mail. You called it Netflix. Talk a little bit about the naming. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny what you just said about there's getting these movies that you want rather than having this miserable experience of wandering up and down the aisles of a blockbuster and then ending up like a lemming at the new release wall. Uh, and we had that very front of mind at the very, very beginning. You know, everyone said it'll never work. And they had two big objections. And one, of course, was blockbuster. But the other objection was they go, it's a digital medium. It's just a matter of weeks before everyone's downloading these or streaming these. Uh, and we realized that if we bet everything on it being a plastic company, if we had called it, for example, the world's fastest shipper of plastic.com, um, it might have done great for a while until that eventually went away because we knew it would. But then again, if we had bet it all on streaming at the beginning, we would have had nine years of nothing before the world was finally ready for that. Right. And so with the positioning we ended up choosing, which I think was one of the smartest decisions we made was to make it delivery agnostic. And the positioning was Netflix is a place to discover great stories uh, because that works. It works when we send it to you on a DVD. It works when we stream it to you. It'll works when we can beam it telepathically into your filling or whatever. Um, it, it just works. And then we just set about to make that real. And that was building all the deep content, making sure we had every single copy, every single DVD available, working on the algorithm for predicting taste, eventually leading to creating our own content. Um, but Which it was, was actually kind decision. of a good idea. So it yeah. transcended. And in 2007, when Netflix began streaming, it wasn't like launching a new company. This was the same company. We had millions of tens of millions of subscribers who already thought of us as a place to get great content. We were just changing how we got it to them. Right, right. Now you had an interesting, it's interesting because now, you know, with Netflix and, and Amazon dominating the streaming wars and dominating even Oscar nominations and things like that, um, you had a meeting with Jeff Bezos, I think it was in 1998. Tell us, tell us that story. 
Yeah, it was interesting because uh, we weren't far in. This is probably the first summer in business. Um, and we get the call from Jeff Bezos uh, inviting us to come on up to Seattle to chat. And it didn't require a lot of uh, intelligence to know what he wanted to chat about. Because believe it or not, just like you may have find it hard to imagine that, that you used to have to go to store to get movies to watch. Well, believe it or not, back then, this company called Amazon only sold books. But uh, Jeff had made no secret of the fact that he was going to be the everything store at some point. And we knew that video and music were the next ones. So he was obviously calling us up to do a make or buy decision. Uh, and so Reed and I flew up to Seattle and it was fantastic. Uh, you know, it, Amazon was in the seedy part of town. We were walking through, there's people shooting up on the sidewalk and broken glass. And we were looking at each other in disbelief that the pioneer of e-commerce, Jeff Bezos, would have his headquarters in Skid Row here. But it was a fantastic meeting because, you know, Jeff and I were kind of chatting about these early days of what it was like at the beginning, how we both had a bell that would ring whenever an order came in. And then at the end, his CTO, his CFO, pardon me, scouted this out and kind of intimated that if this deal was going to happen, it would probably be, you know, low eight figures, you know, which we figured meant probably 14 to $16 million. And Reed and I were going on one hand, that's a lot of money for just about six months work. But don't forget, this was an idea that everyone said would never work. And here was Jeff Bezos, the king, who was seeing something, what we were doing. And also, Reed and I were right at that critical point where we thought we had solved all the big problems. I mean, we had managed to build a website, which was no small feat in 1998. We had managed to find a copy of every DVD available. We had made deals with the DVD manufacturers to distribute coupons in their boxes. We were now ready to start raking it in. Um, and so in many ways, that trip was like a, was more of a commitment ceremony that where Reed and I had to look each other in the eye and say, okay, are we in? Mm -hmm. uh, and were and you cautious going into it? Were you worried about sharing too many secrets? No. And I think that's just part of the fact that I've been, I've been doing, I've been an entrepreneur for so long is that uh, guarding secrets is ridiculously overrated. A uh, 99% of uh, success is the execution. But more importantly, you know, my whole premise is that ideas don't count for anything. The, the idea you start with is never the idea that ends up being successful. So, so what if I share the idea that I started with? Right. That's right. not the process. The process is the evolution of that, that idea. And no one's going to steal that from me. Right. It's really interesting, the dynamic between your personality and Reed's personality, very different personalities. You bring different skill sets to the table. And, you know, that Amazon meeting was interesting because he owned a larger chunk of the, the company. And my impression from reading your book, talking about it, was that, that Reed decided, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sell at this point. Do you think you would have sold if it had been solely up to you, if they'd offered you $15 million for six months of their work? No, no. I, listen, who knows? But I, I extremely unlikely or I have zero recollection of feeling that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've never been motivated in the stuff that I do by the money. Uh, it's, it's not what drives me. Uh, what drives me is the challenge of solving these really interesting problems. It's identifying a problem and trying to figure it out. And to be at this point where you're right in the verge of seeing whether this thing you've been trying to figure out is going to work, hard to imagine he could have bought that away from me. Mm. I mean, listen, never say never. Um, you know, if he had said, I'll give you $150 million for it or $1.5 billion, I mean, who knows? But so it's not nothing. But seriously, this was not in the category I was not interested in, uh, in giving up. Yeah. Um uh, you know, relating to that other question that I asked about connecting the dots backwards, looking backwards, you are related to Sigmund Freud <laughs> and also Edward Bernays, who is a giant of mass media and advertising, kind of called the father of modern day public relations. Um, he figured out in many ways how to apply new discoveries in psychology and psychoanalysis to marketing and sales. How do you view 
that heritage influencing your body of work? Well, I have, it, it, I have, it isn't like, you know, Siggy came to me and said, uh, Mark, this internet thing is going to be huge. <laughs> um, Would have been helpful, probably. <laughs> yeah, because in fact, I had no direct contact with either of them in terms of actually sitting at their knee and listening to their wisdom. But, so but influential, influential, I think you said as a kid, you, there were paintings of them or pictures of them up oh, in the house. Oh, yeah. certainly that's true. They, they, I mean, that it was a big part of the family identity that we came from this lineage. But- and what's weird is the fact that I did end up in being very deeply involved in media and public relations and marketing, having come from that background. But I have no idea how that transference uh, <laughs> takes place. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I'm curious, you know, we wouldn't have Netflix today if it weren't for you. But at the same time, as you look at Netflix today in 2021, does it feel like a part of you or does it feel foreign or, or perhaps a mix of both? What, what do you feel when you hear the company? It's cer well, certainly I have a tremendous pride in what uh, Netflix has become. I mean, it will always be my baby. Uh, but as anyone who has children knows, you're always puzzled as to what was your contribution to the success? Uh, you know, kids do a great things and you go, is that from me? Um, and certainly, my DNA is absolutely all over that company. I mean, culture at a company is to pick one. Culture is not what you say. It's not what you write down. It's not what gets formulated in a boardroom. It's what you do. It gets ma It's how the founders act. It's how they treat each other. It's how they treat their employees, how they treat their customers. Uh, and I can absolutely see those fingerprints. I mean, the analytic focus um, that's a cultural thing that I know came from how Reed and I um, behaved. So uh, I know that a lot of me is in, I mean, I, I, I joke sometimes that it doesn't quite look like me, but it has my nose. Um, <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> but I'm, um, yeah. I'm, I'm as surprised as anybody. It, you know, at, back in 1998, when we started, we just wanted to see if this stupid website could work. We wanted to see if we could find a repeatable, scalable business model. You never imagine you're going to be in every country in the world. You never imagine you're going to make your own TV shows. You never imagine you're going to produce your own movies. And you sure never envision Netflix and chill. I mean, I never saw that coming. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you, so, you know, you, you took the name that will never work. You, you put it on your book. You put it on your podcast. You fully embraced this because you were told it so often. And now you talk to founders all the time on the podcast and in real life and private phone conversations. And do you feel a tension? You know, if someone comes to you and it, it is something that you feel like it will not work, do you feel, do you hold yourself back from saying that to that person? Or how do you, how do you decide when you have to give them the unvarnished truth and say, I really do think this is not gonna work? Or do you always hold back and say, well, maybe it could. Well, the first thing is that, that will never work. There's a tension there. I love that name because it has this tension in it between the fact that everyone knows, everyone hears it all the time, but everyone knows about Netflix and they know about other things they've seen succeed. And that is the fact that yes, sometimes it does, which is the message. Um, that you, you have to keep trying. You have to try something. Um, and the coaching that I do is not uh, pronouncing judgment on people's ideas. That's not helpful. What I'm trying to do on the podcast is what I've been doing with people for 20 years, is that helping them solve problems, encouraging them, to take the idea that's in their head and getting it out in the world, giving them the support as they take the side gig and try and make it into a real, uh, a real business. Uh, and I've been doing that forever. And what's different now is just that I'm recording it. You know, at its heart, being an entrepreneur is lonely. I mean, most of the time you're working on problems by yourself. And almost always the problem you're trying to solve is not something you can go to someone else who solved it before. And, but at the same time, there's so much commonality 
the pe- the idea that pe- the problems that I address on the podcast are ones that resonate with everybody. And it just is great sometimes for someone to hear that someone else has the same problem they do. But then even better to be a fly in the wall as I help someone else work through how to address it, how to solve it, how to approach it. Uh- I'm going to wrap things up in a moment here, but one of my last questions here, when you started Netflix, you, you didn't put any money into it. Um, one, you had Reed to put money into it, uh, but you'd also just had your third child and just bought a house. And you wrote in the book that you, you didn't regret the decision, but rather had a sense of wonder at how little anybody knows at the outset of any startup venture. And I, you know, one of the last questions I like to ask on this podcast is what are people excited about? What trends are they keeping their eyes on in the future? Uh, are there trends that, that you're looking at that you see uh, that you're excited about? Uh, or is it just really hard to predict those sorts of things? It's impossible to predict. And certainly I'm not the guy to predict it. And I don't try and handicap it that way. So it's not like I'm saying, okay, uh, uh, cryptocurrency or yeah. robotics but, or AI. And I mean this respectfully, that is so hard to hear that, that, that you, you can't see the future because, you know, you invented Netflix. Yeah, I mean, geez, you know. Sure, but I didn't do that because I saw uh, House of Cards and The Crown in the future and all I had to do was connect the dots from here to there. I did this because I was trying to solve customer problems and it just led in that direction. Uh, and and, and that is the, uh, that's the very nature of entrepreneurship is you just don't know. What I'm looking for is the people. Uh, they drag me into fascinating things. I mean, on the podcast, just the most recent episode that dropped was someone who's launching a chain, or he hopes it's a chain, of ping pong studios. Uh, autonomous ping pong studios opened with a key, well, with a keypad. You get out the balls out of a locker using another keypad. What a crazy idea, but he's making it work. And it's fantastic. And other of the entrepreneurs I'm speaking with uh, launching a 60,000 square foot indoor action and adventure park with rappelling and zip lines and alcohol. What could go wrong there? <laughs> um, and his challenge is not the logistics or the construction. He's going, this thing's going to be open 18 hours a day, seven days a week. How do I maintain some sense of balance with my family? Mm. Another woman is doing an online erotic art uh, gallery, trying to sell erotic art online. And she's struggling with how do I make social media work when one false slip and I get banned? I mean, these are such interesting things. I just love getting the chance to sit down with people and help them work through how do you approach problems like this? Yeah, the, the podcast is a perfect medium for you, I can say. Having done it for many years, <laughs> you're going to love it. Um, last two questions. So first, I'm a big fan of gratitude. So as you look around at peers, others in your industry, contemporaries, who do you respect, who you admire right now? You know, it's the, the, the thing which has always been my objective in life is balance. Uh, I was lucky enough to launch on that as something I wanted to hold on to. When I was still in my late 20s, early 30s, and have struggled and fought and largely, I think, been successful in doing that. And, and for me, it's different for everybody. But for me, balance is I do need the I do need the business piece of it. It's so intellectually engaging. It's really the intellectual challenge that I have of starting, growing, and making successful businesses. But at the other hand. I've made this vow years ago that I was not going to be this guy on his sixth company and his sixth wife, that I was going to prioritize that relationship, relationship with my kids. And the third thing is I know what makes me personally whole and it's outdoor stuff. It's being able to get out and go climbing, to be able to fly up to Alaska and kayak a river. It's be able to do mountain biking. Um, and those are not the types of activities you can squeeze in between your 11 o'clock meeting and your two o'clock uh, call. You've got to make sure they all fit. So that's a long way of saying that the person I respect a lot is someone who's, I think, done that as best I can tell, which is Richard Branson. You know, I look at him and I go, certainly as an entrepreneur, totally kicks my ass um, in terms of the breadth and range of the company he started but I deeply respect the fact that he has his, still has this tremendous connection to his family, um, you know, still on his first wife, still has a very, very close relationship with his kids. And then certainly deeply respect the um, way that he feeds the rat. 
he still has time to go ballooning around the world to i was i spent some time with him and it was like hey we're going to yeah. swim from this island to that island which is like two and a half miles and, I'm and like, it was it was okay. actually an invitation to speak at his island at necker island that inspired you to write your book do you want to tell us about that uh, certainly it's actually a pretty good story too but you know he he invited me to come speak at the island because they they, they did we were doing a conference and the conference was for a bunch of very successful female business owners who were australian and the purpose the the event was called finding uh, your purpose and it was for people who had, had business success and they're saying well now what and they were there for me to speak about how you turn ideas into realities uh and i went yeah purpose purpose i'll go to necker island this sounds awesome we'll do my little gig and then i'll uh, hang out on the beach with my wife uh and i got there and i did my presentation and i figured i'll stick around for a little while and see what this purpose thing is all about and this neck, neck one speaker after another, after another. And hours later, I'm still sitting in my seat, my towels untouched. And it was like they were speaking to me. Um, they were really making me think, you know, I have this semi not deserved uh, visibility because of Netflix. People will show up and uh, 10,000 people will come to hear me speak for an hour. Mm. I can write and get lots of people to read it, but what do I do with that? What's the point? And it led to this long period of introspection about what is the point? And it said, I think for me, the point is encouraging people to take the same steps that I've taken, to give them this chance to tell them that if you have this idea, if you think you might enjoy being an entrepreneur, if you have something you want to change in your life, um, let me help you do it. Mm -hmm. And that led to the book. Uh, and it led to the podcast and I'm not sure where it will lead next. But yeah. And, and, and also a shout out for you've been involved with 1% for the planet, which is a wonderful organization. So thank you for your, your service yep. to that organization as well. All right. Final question. Yep. Let's pretend we're at awards banquet, much like the Oscars or the Emmys, you're receiving an award for lifetime achievement for everything you've done up to this point. What we all want to know is in addition to family and friends, of course, who are the colleagues, who are the friends, who are the business partners, who are the investors, who are the the mentors, peers, who are the people that you would acknowledge in your remarks? Well, since you're dispensing with the family piece, which of course is a critical piece of support, of you know, you, you don't do a startup by yourself. It's impossible. I mean, there is this ridiculous glorification of the founder as if they do it all themselves. But every idea, every company is a conglomeration of so many people's inputs. You know, there is one person who comes into it with a background in direct marketing. There's another person who comes in with this deep computer science logical background. There's somebody with a late fee on a movie. There's somebody else who had this experience, someone else that one. It's through all those pieces that these things get created. And so I am just so incredibly thankful to all the people who signed on to help make these crazy ideas real. I mean, the people who were early on at Netflix who were doing it for the fun of it. Um, and all the other startups I've done, you know, at Looker, which I did after, after uh, Netflix, that's the great part is being able to come into work, sit around the table with really smart people solving really fun problems. I couldn't have done anything I've accomplished without, uh, without all of them. Mark, such a pleasure talking to you. That Will Never Work is the name of the book and the podcast which you can check out on iTunes and all the different podcast channels and uh, anywhere else, Mark, that people should go to learn more about you or connect with you. Well, certainly for all things Randolph, there's a website, which is markrandolph.com, Mark with a C, Randolph with a PH. And that's where you can find links to the podcast, to the book, uh, to all my social media stuff, to my blog posts. Uh, you'll be sick of me after a while. <laughs> well, I'm certainly not after this conversation. So Mark, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you and have a great day. Thanks, John. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.